Hello everyone. Welcome to Chapter 6 podcast for Sport and Exercise Psychology. I'm going to get my zoom here, uh, hopefully correct at some point. I uh, hope you're all doing well today. Uh, this particular chapter I think is one of the most interesting chapters uh, in the textbook and worthy of some significant discussion. The key concepts in here are how do you really motivate athletes, which is a big question of coaches, of sports psychologists, parents, and so there are some really interesting underlying theories here on feedback, reinforcement, uh, and in particular the ideal form of motivation uh, is intrinsic motivation, although we're always motivated by a mix of intrinsic, which is internal, and uh, extrinsic motives. So we're going to talk a bit about that and some key principles in the research. So the difference here is that if you learn to coach or athletic train or personal train whatever if you learn your profession based on theory and based on the research as opposed to how you were coached then perhaps you're doing a more thorough and a more effective job because generally those people uh, who get into coaching by default as a parent uh, um, or were an athlete and now they become a coach they don't necessarily study coaching they just coach as they were coached so some of the principles here you may find contrary to uh, some, some of your own experiences and uh, I would learn, certainly love to hear about them too on email or some of the discussion boards. So let's get into it for chapter 6. Um, well a simple principle here is what exactly is reinforcement? Um, the book defines this which is a little strange compared to how I was trained but the book includes rewards and punishment in the idea of reinforcement. Now so we'll, we'll stick with the book definitions here, okay? But typically, anything that is a reinforcer will increase the likelihood of something occurring. Um, so the book is actually a little bit off in this in terms of its classic definitions, in my opinion. And anything that is a punishment would reduce the likelihood of the behavior. So a reinforcer would increase the likelihood, and a punishment would decrease the likelihood. Um, and you know we'll give some examples of that so a positive reinforcement would be adding something positive to the situation like praise hey Johnny you did a really good job today uh, on your layups you were jumping off the left foot going up and hitting the backboard uh, on each one of your your layups off the right hand side so that's a very specific positive reinforcement from a coaching standpoint the idea of negative reinforcement is what the book has wrong in my opinion so the book will call negative reinforcement basically equivalent to punishment, which is not. Uh, negative reinforcement would be something like, uh, I bet many of you have experienced this, uh, you take something away that is, a, that is a negative thing that would increase the likelihood of the behavior occurring. So an athlete has a real hard training week, you decide to give them a Saturday morning training off, so you remove a stimulus that's aversive and uh, you increase the likelihood that uh, they're going to be motivated now because you've removed something negative or you take chores away from a kid who's had a really well behaved day something of that nature so positive reinforcement you add something to the situation that would increase the likelihood of the desired behavior occurring uh, negative reinforcement really is removal of a negative stimulus to increase the likelihood so reinforcement is always going to increase it okay and punishment is going to decrease that. So positive punishment would be spanking someone or screaming at them negatively, uh, making them run. That would be positive punishment. Uh, negative punishment would be taking away something positive. So get, taking away a kid's video game because they got in trouble. So something they would actually want to do, you take it away uh, to decrease the likelihood of some behavior occurring. So. Uh, stick with those definitions, uh, they'll, they'll steer you correct. Uh, these principles, however, are, uh, are fairly accurate. Um, generally, we, we like to repeat things that we get rewarded for or make us feel good. I mean, we're not stupid. Uh, the things we're good at, the things that give us positive feedback in our life, we generally encourage, we want to do that again. And if we know some behavior is going to result in an aversive uh, stimulus being punished, we, we tend not to repeat those things. So that's why, um, you know, running as punishment or sprints for punishment. I can remember having to run suicides and all kinds of other things when I did something wrong or teammates did something wrong. That's why they work because we don't want to avoid them. But there are other uh, consequences 
to punishment. So both reinforcement and punishment work, and we're going to talk about the balance of that, but typically punishment has more um, side effects. It's like a drug kind of that has a little bit more side effects in your system. Now, um, figuring out how to motivate athletes and how to use reinforcement is fairly complex because you might yell at somebody or you might praise somebody and two athletes might react in a total different way. One might respond better to criticism, the other responds only to praise and positive things. Um, and sometimes when you give the appropriate feedback it doesn't necessarily guarantee that an athlete will exhibit the same behavior. So taking my example of you know Johnny doing a really good job uh, doing his layups in basketball going off his left foot, using his right hand, hitting the backboard. Uh, that doesn't necessarily mean for sure he's going to be able to repeat that because some of the sporting movements uh, are fairly complex. Or you're teaching a new pitcher to throw a curveball as a strike, well they're not going to be able to do it every single time. So even though you're applying the appropriate reinforcement and being specific, they, uh, they, may, or not, they may not really respond to that. Um, now the receiving different reinforcers really refers to you know, practice, home, a competitive environment. So coaches may be really positive, for example, in a, in a training scenario and give a lot of good, hey, good job, positive feedback. But in a, in a competitive desire, they may get a little bit nervous. Uh, they may not respond in the same way and they may punish much more quickly because they feel that that's the appropriate strategy to do, which it may not be because uh, we'll get to some of the principles of punishment as well. So it's a little bit more complex than you think, and the larger the team and the more diverse the team, like take a football situation, it's a fairly complex sport with all these different sub-positions and sub-coaches, so different coaches may use different strategies and may be appropriate for different positions depending on what they are, the needs of that position are. So it wouldn't be effective, for example, to treat linebackers uh, and punt returners the same way as a quarterback because they have different jobs and different tasks and they're asked to do very different things. So one style may be more appropriate um, for the defensive line versus wide receivers. Okay, so it's fairly complex and ultimately comes down to some of those principles of understanding your participants from the first couple units. Uh, if, if coaches, if sports psychologists understand the athlete they're working with well, they know the person, then they should have a better sense of the appropriate principles uh, to employ. Now, you can imagine sports psychologists are not big uh, fans of the negative approach. We, we are clearly the ones adopting a positive approach, picking out the behaviors that you want to reward, spending your energy on that, and really almost ignoring many of the negative behaviors, unless it's a critical one that you need to, to punish. Now, the many, many coaches adopt a negative approach uh, to certain behaviors, but might even be 50% of the time. So the, the question really comes up, well, how much of the feedback that you give athletes as a coach should be positive and focus on desirable behaviors, and how much time should you spend on punishment? Because as I mentioned before, there are some significant drawbacks to punishment um, that we'll look at uh, right after we deal with some of these uh, initial principles. So. If you're going to choose uh, effective reinforcement principles, um, one of the first things you need to do is figure out what exactly would serve as a reinforcement principle. And as with many of the principles in, in psychology, how do you know what somebody wants as a reinforcer? You need to ask them directly. So um, a coach could, for example, uh, suggest, well, what would, what would you guys prefer to have as punishment? What would be effective reinforcers if you have a great training week? Here's how we're going to measure that. If everyone completes, let's take a swimming team for example, if everyone on the distance crew completes their uh, their yardage and if everyone is training at least X percent or X um, intensity level Monday through Thursday, then what would be the effective reinforce you guys want to do on Friday? Our choices are X, Y, and Z. So you ask them some questions, maybe do a brief survey, and you would find out what those effective reinforces would be. You doubt, it's doubtful you would know because it's unlikely uh, that the one reinforcer you pick randomly would work for everybody. Um, anyway, um, one of the uh, important principles from psychology in, in general is when someone's learning a new skill, they need very regular, um, continuous feedback. So um, in the early learning stages here, you want continuous and intermediate reinforcement. So you'd early on, very early on, every time they did the desired behavior, you would reinforce it and later on you would begin to give um, uh, a little bit slower as you are intermediate. So continuous and immediate feedback 
once the skill is learned, uh, it still would be immediate when you observe the behavior, but they don't need to see it every single time. They don't need to hear it every single time. So early learning, a high volume of feedback, immediate. Um, learn skill um, a little later on. So that idea of you know waiting for mom or dad to come home to get punished, well, that doesn't really work out too well. It doesn't serve as a very effective reinforcer. People need to have it at that moment or not. Um, you do have to identify, and, and athletes or students, for example, need to know what the expectations are. What are the behaviors? So sometimes uh, the way I've seen this work out the best for coaches is coaches will help the team craft up a contract and let the team identify what ha the climate. You know, uh, what should they be on time? And of course, the coaches have some oversight of that process. But they, the, the team will identify the expectations about drinking and timeliness and bringing your gear and all the different behaviors that are on a sports team and then they will also identify some rewards that would be could be achieved and then punishments for specific things and you'd be surprised but team teammates are typically very harsh compared to what coaches might do when it comes to punishment as well so then that gives them some sort of say in the process and help them be autonomous uh, as well <clears throat> for more complex behaviors you have to use what's called shaping, so you might want to check out the definition of that in the chapter. And that's for more of a complex movement where let's take a pole vault or something like that where you have all these different phases of the skill. So you've got the run up, you've got, um, you know, you can even have like how you're holding the pole initially. Um, your starting position, you could reinforce that. You could reinforce the approach. You can reinforce the actual plant, the initial um, run into the bend. And then, of course, the, the, the finishing part of the skill. So you could shape that skill by reinforcing the correct pieces of the behavior, you know, one piece by piece. Um, you cannot focus only on outcomes. You need to focus on effort and performance, and as well, any other behaviors you want to see in your team, such as showing composure under pressure, showing leadership, helping somebody up. You need to identify and target those behaviors if you want them to occur on your team, because otherwise, if they don't occur and there's uh, there's no punishment, then it becomes clear that that is a it's being passively reinforced in a class you know in a in a team situation. So for example, uh, let's say that I'm running my class, a sports psych class, a regular lecture class, and the first couple of weeks uh, it's it's a common occurrence for students' phones to ring, and uh, their students texting in class, and I'm not saying anything about it. So First off, I obviously have not addressed it in class. I haven't identified that that's a behavior that would be inappropriate. And then when it comes up, I'm allowing it to go. So even though I'm not doing anything, it's clearly message sent to the class through vicarious reinforcement is, okay, this is an acceptable behavior in this class, which of course it's not. Um, so the way I shape that is the first time that uh, I see someone doing that, I'm going to give them a warning. The second time, I'm going to kick them out of class. And the third time, I'm going to take 10% off their letter grade. So it's a shaping, and I'm going to, everyone else in class is going to see that, and I'm going to do that in front of the entire class so that everyone gets that message that that's not an acceptable behavior. So that's a form of punishment by calling someone out in public. A very subtle one, I think, but in, in my experience, it's, it's fairly effective. So that's an example of shaping that behavior. Now. There is a really good example of um, the target approach by Ames uh, in your textbook. I'd encourage you to check it out. And you may remember from one of our previous chapters the idea of ego-oriented goal orientations versus mastery or mastery goal orientations. So this approach to creating a positive motivational climate suggests there are several principles here. Um, that spell target. Imagine that. That's why it's called. So it suggests you first identify the tasks that you think are appropriate for this particular environment. That could be effort and showing up on time and how you address your teammates and how you address your uh, your coaches. Um, you share some of the authority by passing that down the road, getting them to um, be involved in choices. Uh, you allow them, the group you're working with, to identify some effective rewards. Okay, you use groupings to create uh, cooperation among the team and help them get to know each other and provide feedback to each other. 
uh, you provide a method of evaluation to so that you're sure that they get performance and task oriented feedback and then you use the appropriate timing for skills so early on you're going to have continuous reinforcement and then you're going to have intermediate um, reinforcement later but regardless you're going to have immediate feedback on desired behaviors so the target approach is something you definitely want to read more about uh, and the whole goal of it is to create a practice environment that is focused on mastery and that is if you don't remember uh, helping athletes get better every day basically and so yes you're still trying to win but you create an environment that helps everyone get better and then the byproduct of that is winning so many appropriate things to do would uh, be to use criticism with with or without sarcasm uh, in, at a high level of course physical abuse would be totally ridiculous uh, and unethical from a coaching or any other standpoint uh, and then just you know getting into the emotional part of it and why are you so lazy and using guilt and are you not committed to this team I mean, questioning the actual individual as opposed to a specific behavior uh, these are things that certainly will send a message but the byproducts of it the negative consequences are far greater uh, than the benefits um, for sure as I mentioned earlier you know there is a recommended uh, ratio here and uh, based on the research, the suggestion is that you do not eliminate punishment. You need it, and particularly if there are athlete, an athlete or athletes really stepping out of bounds uh, and really exhibiting behaviors that are totally unacceptable, you have to punish those behaviors, and you have to punish them immediately and effectively, because otherwise it will send the message it's okay. So, for example, let's say an athlete shows up one morning clearly hungover, smells like alcohol, um, kind of thrown up before practice and coaches really don't do anything about it. They don't call the athlete into their offices. They don't point it out that that's inappropriate. They don't send the athlete home and make them come back for practice later on. So if they don't punish that behavior right there, pretty much everyone else on the team understands that, okay, I guess it's really not that big a deal that we drink during season. Okay, so it wouldn't be enough punishment just for the athlete to go through practice and have to deal with it. You'd have to specifically address that behavior that's unacceptable. You cannot practice. You're out of a game. You have to remove something positive or add something else negative uh, for that situation. Now, some of the drawbacks, as I mentioned, is it can make athletes nervous and arouse a fear of failure. So it's very outcome focused typically, and, and clearly athletes want to, we all want to avoid punishment. So it can, it can arouse a little bit of fear. So you do want to use it, but if you use it too much, then it becomes predominant and your athletes basically become very tentative in their approach and their only goal is to avoid failure. So if you go back to the achievement motivations theories from chapter three, you, that's one of the worst consequences, the worst climate you can build in your team is that they just wouldn't take risks, they wouldn't go after it, they're just going to try to not make mistakes. Uh, sometimes punishment, because of the attention it provides, can actually reinforce a particular behavior uh, which is an unintended consequence. So if every time someone drops a ball, let's say you're doing a wide receiver drill, and every time they drop a ball, uh, you make them run sprints, that actually you might actually be reinforcing the dropping of the ball. There's so many parts of a, a, a wide receiver's routes that you could reinforce. Did they get off the line right? Did they create separation? Did they, did they step into their cut? Did they show the right part of their body did they do a lot of the pieces right and if they drop the ball it's just one part of the route yes it's important but they just need to go back and get after that because in a game situation uh, you don't want them thinking about dropping the ball so basically when you're providing that extra attention you just gotta let that go instead of providing an additional you know attention or you imagine some of the you've, we've all had classes with kids particularly in high school and middle school school that love to act out Sometimes just being uh, punished or yelled at or go sit in a corner actually reinforced the, the, the child's acting out behavior. So things like temper tantrums and acting out and inappropriate behavior are left, are best left as just, okay, ignore it, as opposed to uh, drawing additional uh, intense, uh, attention to that behavior. Uh, and then overall, it creates an environment where people are not encouraged to learn and take risks and really take mistakes they're just trying to perform at a moderate level so if you use punishment too much it will not help your team really grow they'll just perform uh, you know at an average or below average level okay, they're not going to get any better there are some guidelines uh, you do want to do uh, consistent 
uh, use of those principles and you do want to punish the behavior not the person. Uh, as I mentioned before if you can get some input into what would be effective punishments at least then the athletes know if I do X then I know I'm gonna get Y. I already signed a contract and we already talked about that. So for example athlete shows up for practice uh, and if they're more than five minutes late then the next game or competition they don't start that game. They're not allowed to compete. Uh, that would really send a particular message. Now, of course, you can set all the principles you want, but you then have to reinforce or uh, enforce those principles. So you set up clear rules, and then you have to do that for everybody, the starting quarterback, the third-string quarterback. And a lot of coaches, of course, are not willing to do that because they're concerned about all oh, the team might lose or whatever. Well, that's fine. It just underlines your whole system of reinforcement and punishment. Now, you can have different rules for different people. That's a lot of coaches talk about that. Everyone just needs to understand that and, uh, and the way that works because it's typically not that everyone is punished or uh, reinforced evenly. But particularly in a training context, it will really undermine the climate uh, if there's uh, unfair or uneven treatment. Um, I'm sure many of us and many of you have experienced physical activity as a punishment. And the reason that it's not recommended, and it's certainly a very effective form of punishment uh, because it's painful and people don't want to do it. But what happens then is in the off season or when you're away from the context when you're made to be physically active or run, then you will not do that on your own because we're not in the habit of punishing ourselves. So if you had a soccer midfielder, for example, where their fitness is just critical and every time they you know, made mistakes or showed up late for practice or did whatever, you made them run, now they're in the off season. Why would I choose to run? Because I associate running or distance running now with punishment. So I'm not going to punish myself. I'm going to wait till someone else makes me do it. So when the lights are off and the coaches are away, the, so, the side effect of that punishment, using physical activity as punishment, is it's going to result in people not putting forth effort and not being intrinsically motivated, uh, which is what we'll get into. Now, the reason that some coaches uh, can get away with a negative approach, take like a Bill Parcells or... Uh, Tom Coughlin and particularly some of the football coaches that adopt a really negative approach is that they are able to maintain a relationship with the athlete where they really still get the message across that hey I love you you're my guy you're my girl however the coach goes it and they get after him about what they did and that behavior so it seems very negative but the athlete still feels like the coach is behind them that can work that can work as opposed to breaking down and crushing the individual themselves and calling them lazy and they're not committed or you know that's really inappropriate particularly at lower levels where you have random coaches just trying to be out there this is a completely inappropriate use of coaching and it's totally unethical and in fact anyone who berates a seven-year-old kid for not hustling or not doing something uh, correctly related to the sport should never be coaching and they need to figure out a different way to interact with human beings because they're far far out of line so if you're going to coach identify the behaviors you want to reinforce let the team know that don't make it a random confusing situation let them know what the punishments will be and then reinforce the behaviors you want to reinforce and punish the behaviors you want to punish but do it in a way that is very uh, Im impersonal Okay, just that was the behavior. Hey, today you didn't behave well. I still love you, but you got to go home. Okay, you violated team rules. Okay, so I'll see you tomorrow. Get out of here. You can't start in the game. Uh, I'm really not happy about it, but just get out of my face. Okay, you don't have to get on them. They just need to pay the consequences for that behavior. Um, as I mentioned before, competition is different. Uh, you want to be careful punishing errors in competition because it can send a huge message and make that athlete very nervous and have additionally um, performance anxiety. You want to try not to embarrass people too much in front of their classmates or their teammates. It is an effective uh, punishment. I've uh, seen a lot of coaches around here, unfortunately, at WVU, make someone sit in a chair, for example. Let's say they show up late. They have to sit in a chair while the entire team runs. Uh, it's just a form of embarrassment. It's totally unnecessary and has nothing really to do with the actual behavior. You know, one of the other guidelines they don't list here is that the punishment should fit the crime. So, if an athlete is shows up the first day of um, training and they're out of shape, 
they can't pass the conditioning drills, then it would make sense that they need to be punished with additional training because they're on, out of shape. But let's say someone shows up uh, late for a training session. They're there at 6.15 and the entire team's supposed to be there at 6 a.m. for one of these crazy early morning practices. Uh, it would make more sense for that athlete then to pay back those 15 minutes or maybe even 30 minutes after practice than it would for them at that moment to go and uh, have to run extra or, or whatever else because it's a, it's a, it's a crime of time. They need to pun be punished in time. So if someone violated team rules with um, academics, for example, then they need to have punishment in the form of academics. They need to spend an extra two hours of study hall. So the, the crime and the punishment should somehow fit together because then it makes sense for the athlete. But remember that those, those punishments and reinforcements should be administered immediately. So things that are not, you know, the next game, the next practice, today, what are you going to, what are the consequences of that behavior? Because if they're not felt, you know, it's kind of like in Major League fo uh, Sports, if they have a fine for something that the athletes have done. It just makes no sense. It doesn't really punish the behavior. But if they lose a game check and they're suspended, now they're missing media exposure and they're losing a significant amount of money, you know, a game check. So that's a significant punishment. Uh, now, you know, drug-related offenses in the NFL are four-game suspensions. Performance enhancement, four-game suspensions, eight-game suspensions. Personal conduct now, big time, six-game suspension. So those are meaningful punishments because they can't play, and that's really the biggest opportunity for athletes to showcase their skills. So now we're going to transition a bit for the second part of this lecture in this chapter. It's, it's a mixed-up chapter, but this idea of intrinsic motivation is really one of the biggest things you should take away from sports psychology class. So I do encourage you to read this. I'm not going to go over every single principle and definition, but you will be expected to know this stuff on your, uh, your next test. Intrinsically motivated individuals is basically an inner self-determined motivations. They strive, people want to be competent and get better and the key words in here are self-determination and you're going to see a continuum in a moment that, that breaks down motivation across this continuum but if it's intrinsically motivated it's determined by you. You are in full control of that and therefore not dependent on someone else or something else to feel confident or to feel motivated. Now you can imagine how powerful that is because then you don't need anyone else to tell so tell you what to do. Now if you're a coach, if you can create a climate using the target system or other approaches so that your athletes develop intrinsic motivation to work hard, to be leaders, to show good sportsmanship, then when you're not away, that, that behavior will still exist. So the benefit of taking the time to develop intrinsically motivated athletes is, is that when coaches are away, when strength and conditioning coaches are away, it's off season, if the athlete's still intrinsically motivated, they're going to follow that training guideline because they just want to get better. They're intrinsically, internally motivated to feel competent, to determine their own future, and they don't need someone else to uh, be on them about that. So this continuation, uh, continuation, this continuum of intrinsic and extrinsic motivation here goes from very low self-determination where someone is amotivated, thus not motivated at all, okay, either way, through uh, various versions of extrinsic motivation, and those are things that involve some level of external control. And you can see here there's this threshold of autonomy where we are now in control of these forms here. So you should just look through all these definitions um, be familiar with them for the exam. Uh, you don't need to know every single one, every single uh, form of motivation at its place and memorize the whole thing. But you should be familiar with what are some of the forms of intrinsic motivation and what are some of the forms of extrinsic motivation. And the ones that in, intrinsically motivate us are, you know, new stimulation like travel and new places and new things. You know, I can I, I can tell you from observing my my kids, which are very young. One of their biggest forms of intrinsic motivation is just new forms of stimulation. They'll see a new something new in our environment, in our home, and the you know the environment to them is very familiar. And it could be a new bowl, a new bag of chips, a new um, could be a new toy or a new picture, and they want to know immediately what is that. So the they're intrinsically motivated naturally to seek out new forms of stimulation and to understand what that is and to potentially accomplish or to try something. 
And that's why many of us love travel and going to new places, trying new things, because it's a new form of stimulation that motivates us to continue to seek out those things. Because oftentimes, when we go try something new or when we go to a new place, we find part of that very exciting and we learn something new, for example. So these motives, being stimulated, learning new things, getting better, okay, are intrinsic forms of motivation. And the others have something to do with pleasing someone else, basically, or achieving some other means. Uh, and so some of these forms in here, for example, uh, would refer to you want to work out because you're trying to look sexy for your boyfriend or girlfriend. So it's a valid reason. It might be a very powerful, meaningful reason. Often these reasons in here are very meaningful to the individual, but they're also externally controlled and somewhat vague, so they're not totally uh, self-determined. So these higher self-determined means I know when I feel like I've gotten better, I'm keeping myself accountable. Over here, there's someone else, like a coach, a boyfriend, a girlfriend, a parent, keeping me uh, in check. And so when we don't have this control now, that's when we're not sure when that motivation is going to go away. When you do have the control, it generally reinforces itself and stays long term. So intrinsic forms of motivation are generally sustaining over the long term. Extrinsic forms of motivation are not. Uh, and they're somewhat dependent on that. So for example, your uh, motivation to work out because you want to be sexy to your boyfriend or girlfriend, if you guys split up or that relationship is over, you may you know, now lose your motivation to do that. Or let's say now you got married to the boyfriend or girlfriend, are you still uh, motivated to do that or did it change? Because I've seen a lot of my friends uh, shift in their approach. They're, until they get married they were active and wanted to look good and then after that they got very comfortable and they were not at all motivated um, to stay in shape or to look good um, for their spouse, which I found very strange. Like Most of my friends have gained you know, 50, 60, 70 pounds and uh, fortunately I've been able to uh, stave that off. Uh, some additional factors influencing whether uh, folks will be intrinsically motivated is um, some social factors in here and you guys can read more about these but basically it has to do with the climate that's created by the coach uh, what's the competition focused on here and then are they actually being successful at all or how much failure are they experiencing because they will need some sort of success that it's working out and these are key factors in the self-determination continuum that suggest that we all need these um, needs to be fulfilled sorry to use the definition in the uh, use the term in the definition uh, for us to develop intrinsic motivation so the climate should provide an opportunity for us to get better to feel competent autonomy is choice that we feel like we have choices in this environment and we're not being controlled and we have an opportunity to meet and connect and get to know other people so this is really the team the relationship piece this is getting better and this is my own level of choice and providing for that choice so that I'm developing hey I have the ability to control my own level of motivation I'm not totally dependent on others and these are some key factors to understanding why some athletes are not motivated in certain environments remember individual by situation psychology is always a combination of what the individuals bringing in in this case their needs uh, into a particular environment in a competitive environment so there are some great studies that are cited in your book. You should definitely read about them if you're a sports psych nut that suggest that sometimes extrinsic rewards will actually undermine intrinsic motivation. Now, the classic examples um, here would be like contracts, professional athlete contracts, scholarships. They're not always undermining intrinsic motivation because you can imagine as we're younger, we gravitate to activities that are intrinsically motivating to us that we like, our parents like, and over time, if you become a professional of any kind, you know, really college athletes are professional athletes to me, they're being paid to play, then what happens to an athlete's intrinsic motivation? So the theory here from uh, DC and Ryan is cognitive evaluation theory and suggests that when the athlete perceives that extrinsic reward as controlling, there will be uh, a decrease in intrinsic motivation. So they perceive that they're being controlled and so their scholarship, for example, they have to compete to keep their scholarship is their main motive. Well, they're going to see a decrease. So if you get an, um, an informational aspect, so in other words, they, they feel like the scholarship is 
saying, hey, I'm good enough to compete at Division One level, and it provides feedback about their competence, then they're going to increase the likelihood that they're intrinsically motivated. So it all gets down to the perception of the reward, the be it financial or what, whatever the external thing is. I'm here. I'm using a scholarship or a contract. Basically, gets down to when it's controlling, it's work, and I'm doing it for somebody else. When it's informational, it's for me. I'm still playing. I feel good about it, and I'm going to maintain my uh, intrinsic motivation. Now, the optimal form of intrinsic motivation is flow. Um, these are the moments when we are performing at a high level. Basically, what feels like you're not even trying. You know, it's a very much a zen-like state that uh, you're in the rhythm and it feels the easiest thing uh, that you've ever done. And some of the essential elements that are reviewed in your chapter is uh, you're, you're in tune with the challenge and the skills. There's a balance there. You're totally absorbed. You're merged into the, uh, the moment. Basically, you're totally in the moment. Uh, it's a hard thing to achieve, but there's no criticism of it. There's no uh, evaluation of it. You're in the moment. You're in the zone. It's a fleeting thing, but boy, is it beautiful when it happens. Uh, you lose right, your own self-talk. Uh, you feel like you can control everything. You'll hear pitchers talk about how they could put it anywhere they wanted. The catcher's mitt seemed like a you know a huge basket. There was no doubt every single time they could throw exactly where they wanted to go. And, and they're purely involved into the activity. There's no concern about external consequences. So it's a really great example. It's almost a very meditative state that um, through practice and through preparation, athletes might have the opportunity to get into. And I encourage you to read about some of the examples. There's been some great research in this topic. Um, tons and tons of research in sports psychology on flow. Um, this particular model is important to understand. So it, it has an interaction here of the skills of the individual and the challenge of the task. So the idea here is that when there's a match between high above average or high skills and the, a high challenge, that is the opportunity for the athlete to experience flow. If you have an athlete with high skills but their challenge is low, then the natural result is boredom. Nice picture here huh, by this uh, very attractive young lady. Uh, if the challenge is high but the skill of the athlete is low, then you can imagine that athlete might be anxious, although this guy doesn't particularly look anxious. Um, if both the challenge is low and the skills of the individual low, then you would have apathy. So the, the condition you should all be familiar with is this, but you should also have a sense of what happens if you know, there's a, a low skill situation and the person is, very, is presented with a very high challenge. Well, they're obviously going to be nervous in that circumstance. Okay? And the, same, the opposite is true. If you present a high skill athlete with a low challenge, then they're bored. They're not even interested in the task. So in order for an athlete to achieve flow, there needs to be a match between the challenge of the task, and that could be the, com the opponent or the, the level of training, and then the, uh, the sk their own skills. So there's that match, and that's the merging of that. Now there's a variety of factors that the book goes through uh, ad nauseum that will prevent athletes from entering flow or will disrupt it. I'm just going to highlight a couple here, and I would suggest you go back and have a look at some of those uh, for your exam. In particular, you should be familiar with what are the features of flow, the, the flow diagram that I just reviewed. Uh, and then you should at least be familiar with some of these ideas that disrupt flow from occurring. Uh, there's really two here in terms of preparation. It is the lack of physical and or mental preparation or readiness for a particular event. And that could be due to fatigue or lack of conditioning. Or simply not feeling good could be related to nutrition, but basically you're not in the right physical state. And you have remember back to optimal performance, uh, I'm sorry, optimal arousal states. So you basically need to be in that moderate level of arousal, feeling good, feeling energetic. Uh, so anything that's going to disrupt that would, of course, prevent you from getting into that particular. Because this is a physical and a mental state that you could be in. It could also be a lot of negative mental stuff going on, not controlling your self-talk. Um, definitely not thinking positively, uh, not sure about the scenario you're entering into, whereas a, an athlete that is, has an opportunity for flow just feels ready. There's not a lot of chatter in their minds. Uh, this idea of flow, there's basically no thought, only action. It's basically the merging of consciousness. Uh, and you'll, you'll experience this a few times in your career. 
if you're an athlete. Um, when athletes are interviewed, they, they, they suggest maybe 5%, 10% of all the opportunities they're in competition would they be in a flow state uh, and have maybe a peak experience in that. Uh, as I mentioned before, thinking is not good. Um, any sort of worry or external distractions and not, not really focusing on the task ahead of them right in the moment right now will be uh, prevent you from getting into that. So as a sports psychologist, things you help athletes do are identify uh, the things they can control for sure and in their, in their best performances, what has it felt like, what have they been doing, how have they prepared, what are they focusing on, how are they eating, and they want to replicate that to some degree that so they have a routine that becomes very predictable and comfortable, yet they have flexibility to move in case something occurs um, in that routine. You know, others are, you know, putting pressure, doubting yourself, uh, anything that once you're in the flow state could be changes to the competition, changes in weather, coaches comment, all kinds of things can disrupt that. So as soon as you start to pay attention to something external to the moment, you now disrupted it. So if you start to think, and this happens to golfers all the time, like they're having a great round and they start to think, wow, if I keep this up, I could shoot, and they start to do the math in their head, I could shoot a even par 72. Wow. And so now their attention is to the outcome, they're gone. Flow's gone, the zone is gone. So this is a very delicate thing that um, athletes often disrupt and they have to learn to not question it. When they're right in the middle of that river flow, they just need to ride that river all the way out until it, until it you know, reaches the beach uh, instead of coming outside of it and thinking too much. So putting pressure, doubting yourself, getting your brain involved too much instead of just letting your body roll. So read a little bit more about flow. It's a great topic in sports psychology. And if you're ever thinking about coaching um, or doing personal training or physical therapy or anything where you're going to interact with people and provide them with feedback, I encourage you to revisit this chapter and check out some of the simple principles on behavior modification, how to use reinforcement and punishment so that you can be more effective in your job. Hope you enjoyed the podcast and look forward to talking to you uh, in the next chapter.